Hey everyone, we are next on to the exponential and gamma distributions. Uh, we're going to be talking some more about some uh, special continuous random variables in statistics and probability. And uh, we're going to start by talking about the exponential distribution, but we've already seen a lot of the exponential distribution. We've already done a lot of those calculations. I was using it as an example distribution. So let's kind of recall what we have uh, seen so far over the previous videos. Uh, let's say that x follows an exponential distribution uh, with uh, mean parameter mu. If this is the case, then the PDF for this random variable is going to be either 1 over mu, e negative x over mu, uh, for x greater than or equal to 0, or it's going to be 0 otherwise. The CDF for an exponential distribution with mean parameter mu is going to be uh, 1 minus e negative x over mu for x greater than e, x greater than or equal to 0 or 0 otherwise the expected value of such a random variable is of course mu hold on so is that button still refusing to work all right so this is still mu and its variance is equal to mu. And we could say that our quantile function, eta of p, will be, uh, what did we have? Um, negative mu ln 1 minus p if uh, p is in the interval uh, 0 to 1. It will be 0 if p equals 0, and it will be infinity if p equals 1. Which, of course, means that our quantile function isn't strictly a function since infinity is not a number. Uh, but you get the idea of what it's trying to say. Like, if we could say that infinity was a number, then this is what it would be. All right, exponential random variables can be used to model waiting times, particularly when a process is memoryless. That is the time remaining until the process uh, terminates is independent of how long the process has currently taken. Or, uh, yeah, so proposition two, memoryless property. Let's let's suppose that t is following an exponential distribution with mean mu. Then the probability that t is greater than or equal to t plus t naught, given that t is greater than or equal to t naught, is the same as the probability that t is greater than or equal to t. Uh, what this is saying is that if you know that you've waited uh, t naught, at least t naught seconds uh, for a process to terminate, uh, it you you basically get to restart. And uh, if you're wondering how if it's going to take at least t more seconds, uh, knowing that it's taken at least t naught seconds or that t naught seconds have passed uh, tells you basically nothing about the distribution or when this process is going to terminate. Um, because this is basically, if you, even if you'd started out, like where it, right now, at this moment, t naught seconds have passed, and whether it's going to complete in t seconds is exactly the same as if it, uh, t naught seconds ago you asked the same question. Okay, so uh, let's prove this. The probability that t is greater than e or equal to t plus t naught. Uh, given t is greater than or equal to t naught, that's going to be the probability of. So we have the intersection of the two events. So the intersection of t is greater than or equal to little t plus uh, t naught. Uh, oh, uh, are we running out of room? No, not quite. Uh, intersected with the event that t is greater than or equal to t naught. Uh, divided by the probability that t is greater than or equal to t naught. Okay, and oh, go stop doing that. Ugh. All right, so this is uh, so in the denominator we have the probability that t is greater than or equal to t naught. And now let's examine the set that we're 
that we wrote down in the numerator, what is the intersection of these two events going to be? So we require essentially either that, uh, let's maybe create a number line that might, uh, uh, let's, let's create a number line that might uh, be somewhat revealing. Here is t naught, here is uh, uh, t plus t naught, and we need to be greater than or equal to, all right, so this thing is uh, increasing. So we need to be greater than or equal to t plus t naught. So we need to be in the blue region. And we also need to be in the red region. We need to be in both of those regions. But clearly, if we're going to be in both of them, then we are going to be in the blue one. And the blue one is a subset of the red one, right? In other words, if you need to be both greater than or equal to t and t plus t naught, and also greater than or equal to t naught, since being greater than or equal to t plus t naught is the more restrictive condition, that is effectively the condition that takes over. So this is going to be the probability that t is greater than or equal to t plus t naught divided by the probability that t is greater than or equal to t naught. And we can compute those probabilities. Uh, 1 minus the CDF is going to be, well, okay, we, could, we have kind of this simplifying fact that 1 minus f of x parameterized by mu is going to be e negative x over mu, assuming that x is appropriate. I'm going to let you uh, sh see that yourself. Uh, I'm going to leave that as an exercise for you, but it's not at all hard to see that that's the case. So we have e negative 1 over mu, uh, t plus t naught, divided by e negative 1 over mu t naught. And the t naught in the numerator and the t naught in the denominator cancel out. So you're left with uh, e negative 1 over mu uh, t, which is what we want, which is equal to the probability that t is greater than or equal to t, which is what we wanted to show. All right, hence these random variables are memoryless. All right, so exponential random variables play an important part in Poisson processes. The time between subsequent jumps of a Poisson process with parameter alpha follows an exponential distribution with mean mu, which is equal to one over alpha. So let's work on an example. Your daughter's team uh, scores on average 10 points per game. You model the points scored by her team in a game with a Poisson process and t equals one is a whole game. Based on this, what is the expected time between jumps uh, scored by your daughter's team. Okay, so for this, uh, we could say, uh, uh, let's say that TI is, so let TI be the time between points i minus 1 and i for i greater than or equal to 1. Okay, so we can then say that for any i, the ex uh, ti, which is going to be the time between a jump in the process, which corresponds to the soccer team scoring a point uh, is going to follow an exponential distribution with a uh, mean parameter one over 10. Okay. Uh, because the alpha parameter is, uh, is a 10 is a 10, I believe. Is that right? Yeah, 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 that's right. So the alpha parameter is 10. So, in this problem. So that means that the expected value of ti is going to be, well, 1 over 10. There we go. Uh, next part. Suppose that by the start of the second half, your daughter's team has scored three points. Given this, what is the expected time when your daughter's team, uh, when your daughter's team score is four points? Well, uh, all right, so in this case, we're studying with T4, so uh, we are 
asking what is the expected value of T4 knowing that uh, that we have reached half time. And that at halftime, there are three points. Well, okay, in this situation, uh, T4, so we know that T4 is following an exponential distribution uh, with mean parameter 1 over 10. Thing though is, uh, knowing this information, then T4 uh, is going to be equal to, um, let's say, uh, it's going to be equal in distribution to T1 plus 0 0.5 because of that memoryless property. So we know that it has been, uh, that it's up to half time, but after that, you're basically just adding one half to an exponential random variable because. What we're saying essentially is that when we're saying that a random variable is uh, memoryless, is that its distribution doesn't, its conditional distribution, conditioning on the fact that it's been so long since the process has started, doesn't change. So that means, um, so so that means that uh, we can, uh, I, I suppose we could say say this, um, so that. That that means that we can basically just uh, add one half. Oh, we I don't know. I don't want to say that. We could just add one half, and uh, we will have accounted for the fact that it's after half time. So then, the expected value of t one plus zero point five is going to be uh, zero point one plus zero point five, which is equal to zero point six. So in other words. Uh, we expect the fourth point to be scored six tenths of the way through the game. Okay. And here's some R code that's doing a lot of this stuff. Uh, this is just basically computing an expected value for when the rate parameter is 10 uh, of a exponential random variable. So compute its expected value and so on. All right. So we've seen a lot of this stuff before already. Uh, so let's go ahead and move on. Uh, we're now going to talk about gamma random variables. And before we do that, we have to talk about the gamma function. So the gamma function, gamma alpha, is going to be gamma alpha, which is equal to the integral from 0 to infinity, x alpha minus 1, e negative x, dx, for alpha greater than zero and that's what it is I don't get to write anything really simpler than that in general there are special cases for which gamma alpha is known uh, for instance it can be determined via integration by parts that gamma of alpha plus one is equal to alpha times gamma alpha Right, and furthermore, gamma alpha uh, gamma of one is equal to one. Now, the fact that gamma one equals one is pretty easy to see, uh, because you could, uh, bas basically, when you're doing this integration, you're only integrating the blue part, and if you're integrating only the blue part, that integral is going to be one. You should know this by now, because that's basically the PDF of an exponential distribution with mean parameter one. You're integrating it over its uh, over the over the support of that random variable uh like there are several different reasons now why that integral is going to be one but that's what it's you're going to end up with so based off of these two facts where this first fact you can determine this using integration by parts so this is found by integration by parts
So if you're planning on taking more advanced math classes, I would hope that you would take the time to go through the exor- uh, to go through the motions of integrating by parts to see that this relationship does in fact hold. All right. But once you have these two facts, you get to say that gamma of n plus 1 is equal to n factorial. If you're familiar with proofs, if maybe you've taken discrete mathematics, this can be proven via induction. So, but this is this is basically a consequence of that. So therefore, we get to say that the gamma function is the continuous analog of n factorial. Right. So n factorial was something that we were defining in terms of uh, integers, but now we get to determine uh, to define it in terms of positive real numbers and not just the integers. So you get to move uh, beyond uh, what we what we had before. All right, uh, here's some other facts. It can be determined that gamma of 1 half is equal to the square root of pi. And additionally, we have that gamma of 1 minus z times the gamma function at z is equal to pi over sine uh, at uh, pi z. Ugh, okay, I'm gonna have to I'm gonna have to put that in a better place. Okay, so uh, gamma z gamma one minus z is equal to pi over sine uh, pi z. When z is not an integer. Remember that blackboard bold z? That is referring to the integers. So for non-integer z, you have uh, this relationship. And there are more. There are more identities for the gamma function. This is a well-studied function uh, because it's appearing in many, many places. So we do know the value of the gamma function uh, at certain alpha, but uh, in general, we don't know what this is, and we are forced to just leave this formula, this uh, integral as it is, and just say, this is what it is, this is how we're defining it. If you want to compute this thing, we have to compute it numerically. Okay, so there is um, Another function called the lower incomplete gamma function, which we're calling gamma alpha x, but this is a lowercase gamma rather than an uppercase gamma. And the lower incomplete gamma function, gamma alpha x. Uh, hold on. Okay. All right. That is equal to the integral from 0 to x. Um, t alpha minus 1 e negative t dt. And this yields what we call the obvious. <laughs> uh, this is basically an ob there's an obvious relationship. If you were to take uh, this upper end of the integral x and send it off to infinity, then you're going to get the the full gamma function. So you end up with this relationship that the limit as x approaches infinity of the lower gamma function is going to equal gamma at alpha. So the full or complete uh, gamma function at alpha. Okay. Once you have these functions, you can define the CDF and PDF of what's known as the gamma distribution or a gamma random variable. All right. So this random variable is specified by two parameters, alpha and beta. Uh, these are known as the shape and the scale parameters, respectively. So this is a shape parameter. And this is a scale parameter. And our PDF for this random variable. Uh, so f, oh. So f of x. With parameters alpha and beta is equal to one over gamma alpha, uh, beta to the power alpha, x alpha minus one, uh, e negative x over beta for x greater than or equal to zero. 
uh, if uh, x is less than zero, then we're gonna have zero for our PDF. So I'm not even gonna bother to write it. All right, the probability that x is less than or equal to some little x, which corresponds to the CDF of this random variable. So this is the CDF of this random variable. Uh, we have two parameters, alpha and beta. That is going to be uh, literally by definition, the integral from zero to x, um, f of t alpha beta dt, if x is greater than or equal to zero, otherwise it's going to be zero, which is equal to, furthermore, uh, the incomplete uh, gamma function evaluated at x over beta uh, divided by the full gamma function uh, if x is greater than or equal to zero and it's zero otherwise okay all right so if beta is equal to one then we were going to refer to uh, the random variable with parameters gamma alpha 1 as the standard gamma distribution for that alpha. So there are different standard gamma distributions for different alphas. Uh, but, yeah, you get you do get one standard gamma distribution. This is basically setting the scale parameter equal to 1. Uh, we do have a table in Devore's book, table 8.4, that's giving the values of the CDF of the standard gamma distribution for, partic for particular alpha and x. Um uh, since we are working largely on computers, though, uh, I don't know how much attention we are actually going to pay to that fact. So the standard gamma distribution can be used to compute probabilities involving non-standard gamma distributions in the following way. Let's call, just for notation, x a gamma random variable or an arbitrary gamma random variable. So it has a shape parameter alpha and scale parameter beta, and we will define a corresponding standard gamma random variable. So this random variable has shape parameter alpha and scale parameter one. Uh, then the probability that x is less than or equal to little x is equal to the probability that y is less than or equal to x divided by the shape parameter beta. So what that suggests is when tabulating uh, quantities for computing CDFs for gamma random variables, you only need to do it for the standard gamma random, uh, random, random variable. You only need to worry about the shape parameter and not the scale parameter. And if you look at table 8.4, that is what you'll see uh, happening. All right. Uh, so the mean and variance of gamma, gamma random variables. For the mean, we get alpha times beta. And for the variance, we get alpha beta squared. Okay. Uh, example 17. In a paper by Husek et al., the amount of rain in millimeters in Istanbul is Fit it. Does Istanbul have two L's or one L? I think that's a mistake. There should be one L, not two. Not two. Oh well. Um, all right. So the amount of rain in Istanbul fitted to a gamma distribution. Uh, so they fitted the amount of rain in, in, in Istanbul to a gamma distribution, and the author estimated that the distribution of the amount of rain in April uh, is R, and it can be modeled by a gamma random variable with shape parameter 0.436 and scale parameter 11.05. So based off of this, compute the mean and standard deviation of the April rainfall. Uh, so the mean, so the mean is going to be, according to those formulas, 0.436 uh, times 11.05, which is going to be 4.8178. The variance of our random variable is going to be 0 0.436 times 11.05 squared, which is equal to uh, 
two, three, six, six, nine. Finally, the standard deviation of our random variable is going to be the square root of the variance, which is approximately 7.296. Okay, so here's a curve of that random variable. Uh, this is what its PDF will look like. Uh, and uh, I computed its mean. Uh, we have in R, the shape parameter of this corresponds to alpha and the scale parameter that corresponds to beta. So this is how we would compute its expected value. Here's how we compute its variance. Uh, this is probably looking a whole lot like what we've done before. I even computed the probability that uh, in a year you get more than, let's see, is is that uh, annual again? Uh, no, just April. So the probability that in April you get uh, more than one millimeter of rain. Uh, so you could compute that using the P gamma function. Notice I'm using lower tail equals false because I want the probability that uh, the amount of rain exceeds a millimeter. And this is the probably that we end up with. So about a 60% chance. All right. Uh, let XT be a Poisson process with rate parameter alpha. Let TK be the time until the process is equal to K. That is, TK is the smallest T such that XT is equal to K. So that means that XTK is equal to K. Uh, the distribution of TK is, in fact, known. Uh, the distribution of TK will be a gamma distribution uh, with, let's see, so uh, the shape parameter will be K and the scale parameter will be uh, one over alpha, if I remember correctly. Uh, yes, yes, that is correct. That is correct, that is how I've written things down. You kind of have, remember how I mentioned with uh, the exponential random variable, there's some issues about the notation and we might specify things in terms of the mean or in terms of the rate. The gamma distribution also has a similar issue, this similar conflict in notation. And that's why I had to think about it for a little bit if it would still in fact be one over alpha, but it is. And actually it gets to the point uh, which I make uh, not here, not here, but here, that in fact, there is a relationship between gamma random variables and exponential random variables. Uh, and in fact, uh, well, okay, you know what? We're already here. Uh, this is page uh, 137 of the main lecture notes. Uh, so, if, um, so if X follows an exponential distribution, uh, with mean parameter mu, that's going to be true if and only if x is also following a gamma distribution uh, with shape parameter 1 and scale parameter mu. And in fact, let's go back a little bit to... Uh, let, let's go back up to the mean and variance that I wrote down for a gamma random variable. Notice that we could think of, uh, if we're talking about a Poisson process, the time until the kth occurrence of an event, uh, well, we know that the times separating the occurrences of those events are exponential random variables. And let's suppose for a second that they are, well, okay, they're not just exponential, they're independent exponential, right? They're, in, they're all independent of each other. So... You could think of the time until the kth occurrence as the sum of k independent and also identically distributed exponential random variables. And in that case, you would have for your mean uh, the expected value of tk. You would have for that uh, k 1 over alpha, which is k times the expected value of one of those independent exponentials. And for the variance, you would have k1 over alpha squared, which is k times the variance of one of those. Hmm. Intriguing fact. Okay. Um, 
It looks like I've chosen some unfortunate notation where in a previous example, I was using TK to mean the time separating jumps. Um, but here I'm using TK as the time until the kth jump. And that's unfortunate. Um, I apologize that I did that notation. It's, uh, it's not exactly easy to work with. So, um, or, okay, it's, Oh, okay. It's it's easy to work with, but it's somewhat confusing that um, here when I write TK, that's not going to be the same TK that I was uh, mentioning in the previous example. So I'll even just make a note of that to uh, help you clarify. So not the same. So this is not the same uh, TK as before. My apologies. Sorry about that. Anyway, uh, TK. So what is the me? So this is going to be the time until uh, the kth jump, and that follows a gamma distribution uh, with shape parameter k and scale parameter one over ten, because in this case the alpha parameter is ten. Uh, so in this case, if we're interested. And the mean and standard deviation of the time until the team scores five points. The random variable in question is T5, which is following a gamma distribution uh, with uh, shape parameter 5 and scale parameter 1 over 10. Okay, so I want the expected value of T5, but this is the time until the team scores their fifth point. That's going to be, well, uh, the shape parameter is 5 and the scale parameter is 1 over 10. So this is going to be one half, or half time. So you expect the team to score their fifth point at half time when they're on average scoring 10 points a game. Super intuitive. Now we need the variance of T5. So the variance of T5 is going to be five times uh, one over 100, which is going to be uh, five over 100, which is one over 20. So that means that the standard deviation of T5 is going to be the square root of 1 over 20, which is uh, 1 over 2 times the square root of 5, for what it's worth. Or if you don't like uh, ra um, uh, roots in the denominator, if you're one of those people who actually cares about that sort of thing, this is the square root of 5 divided by 10. Whatever. I don't really care. Let's see. Uh, if you, I, I suppose that that's a little bit easier to work with because we could say, all right, what's the square root of 5? Well, the square root of 5, 2 squared is 4, and 3 squared is 9. So the square root of 5 is slightly larger than 2. So that means that the standard deviation is going to be around 0 0.2, like maybe 0 0.23 or something. So on average, the time, the time it takes to... Uh, score that fifth point it's going to be half time and within about uh, like a third of the game and a seventh of the game so you could think of it that way all right what is the probability that the time that the time until her team scores five points is before half time so what is the probability that the time that her team scores five points is before half time Okay, so uh, let's see. If we really wanted to work with standard gamma random variables, then we could say, all right, we got T5 uh, following a gamma uh, with shape parameter 5, scale parameter uh, 1 tenth. The corresponding... Uh, the uh, corresponding standard gamma would follow a gamma distribution uh, with shape parameter 5 and scale parameter 1. So that would mean that this is equal to... Um, so we could divide both sides by the scale parameter. Uh, so that would be... This is the probability then that... Uh, 
10 times t5, oops. So 10 times t5, which is the same as dividing by 1 10th, is less than 5, which is equal to the probability that our standard gamma random variable is less than 5. Okay. Okay, then. So if we wanted to use that, we now need to go to R. So we go to R and we say, all right, so the variable, in, the function in question is going to be P gamma. So we want uh, to work with a standard gamma. So our, um, our input is going to be 5. And we do need to say that the shape is equal to uh, 5. All right, so it says 0.5595, we'll say. So this is uh, approximately 0.5595. Alternatively, though, we could have said, all right, we got the shape parameter and we got the scale parameter. So scale equals 10, but we're gonna have to change the input. Uh, so that instead of being five, it'll be 0 0.5, uh-oh. Mm. Oh, right, the scale parameter is one divided by 10. There we go, that's the same number. That's 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 better. Okay. Uh, all right, so here is the curve of this uh, ra gamma random variable that we've been studying in this problem. Uh, we compute its mean, its variance, its standard deviation. So, oh yeah, our, my guess that it was about like 0.23 was pretty close. Um, and then the probability that it's greater than one is you know, what, what we give. All right, so uh, we also have what, what I mentioned before that exponential random variables are actually a specific, a specific case of a gamma random variable. So gamma random variables include exponential random variables. Uh, additionally, there's another uh, class of variable that we're gonna talk about in, in this section called the chi-square distribution. So uh, the chi-square distribution, such random variables are denoted like so. Uh, we say x follows the chi-square distribution with degrees of freedom parameter nu. Oh, maybe you remember me mentioning this idea of degrees of freedom way back in chapter one uh, when talking about the sample variance. Well, uh, there is a distribution that uses degrees of freedom as its parameter. Uh, so, uh, now, in this case, it turns out that a chi-square distribution uh, is basically the same as a gamma distribution with shape parameter nu divided by two and scale parameter two. Uh, in which case, you automatically get that the expected value of such a chi-squared random variable, uh, so of x is going to be, well, it's gonna be nu over two divided by, nu divided by two times two, which is going to be nu, and its variance is going to be two nu because you're gonna have nu divided by two times two squared, or four, so nu divided by two times four, which is two nu. Okay, so why do we care about this? Not so much for modeling real world phenomena, because I can't imagine using a chi-square distribution to attempt to model a real world phenomena when you could use the gamma distribution instead and not and have two parameters instead of one. I would imagine that by doing that, you would be allowing yourself a more general fit and uh, uh, more like freedom in what distribution you're allowing. So I don't think that chi-square distributions are used so much to model real world phenomena, but they're very important in statistics. They show up as the uh, limiting distribution of certain statistics or the actual distribution of certain statistics. So it's more important as a statistical distribution, as a distribution describing the uh, uh, de describing the behavior of certain statistics, rather than something that's modeling real world behavior. Uh, but whatever, we will work with the chi square distribution for now. There is a table for working with the chi square distribution in Devor's book. It's table eight point seven, um, uh, which uh, I'm not really going to mention here. In 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 this class, we would only ever use. Uh, R. So, 
Uh, suppose that S squared follows a chi-squared distribution with 9 degrees of freedom. Compute the expected value of S squared, the variance of S squared, and the probability that S squared is greater than 3.325. So the expected value of S squared is equal to 9. The variance of S squared is equal to 2 times 9, which is 18. And now we need the probability that S squared is greater than 3.325. And for that, we're just going to go ask R what it is. So the function that we're using is P chi squared. So P chi SQ. So we're putting in uh, 3.325. And the degrees of freedom parameter is df rather than nu. This is going to be 9. And then finally, we want the upper tail. So we would say lower tail equals false. So false. Oh, by the way, I think I should mention this. There's also these, uh, uh, we could have done alternatively f. And that does the same thing. So there's kind of this short, shorthand f and t for false and true. Don't use those. Please don't use those. The reason why you shouldn't use those is because I am allowed to change their value. Right? Or, 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 or more maliciously. More maliciously. Like, we're going to say T is false. <laughs> yeah, it's not going to stop us, so we get this. That's, that's not what we wanted. <laughs> so do not do that. Do not use those things. R allows it, and they should probably should just forbid it because it's too easy to change. You are allowed to change those values, so you cannot count on what they're going to be in general, right? Like, if you haven't said it in your session, then I guess you're okay, but it's just better to not do it. Okay, uh, the probably that we got in the end was uh, uh, 0.95, I guess. So, uh, and uh, we can...